Okay, hello, I'm Dr. Gabriel Andrade. I will be beginning a series of lectures on behavioral sciences. These are basically preparations for the US MLE Step 1, which is the exam that all medical students have to take in order to become doctors. And the first topic we're going to cover is medical ethics and the principles <coughs> of medical ethics. So we're going to be covering here how should doctors behave in specific circumstances according to ethical behavior. There are some ethical guidelines that we will follow and these ethical guidelines will inform how doctors should behave in specific situations. So let's cover in this lecture the principles of medical ethics. In USMLE exams, sometimes questions come up, so it's important for doctors to know how to handle different tricky situations about what is ethical. So let's begin with some basic concepts. Let's first begin with uh, morality, ethics, and legality. I think everybody, not just doctors, uh, should wonder what morality is and how that relates to ethics and how that relates to legality, to the laws. Now, this is regardless of whether or not you're a doctor. I mean, every citizen, every, and for that matter, every human being should be concerned about what's the right thing to do, what's moral. Uh, every profession has a code of ethics and even if you're not a professional uh, all human beings have a natural sense of morality there were some philosophers who talked about a uh, natural right and natural law uh, some people say it comes from God but you don't have to be a believer in order to understand this some people say that it's just human nature to behave in any specific manner and that this is how we should behave. Now, philosophers have been arguing for many centuries where ethics comes from, and we're not going to be so much concerned with this, but we should pay attention to the basic concepts about what morality, ethics, and legality are. So let's begin with morality. Well, morality comes from the Latin word moris, which means practice or um, behavior or costume. I mean, how we should behave. So morality has to do with personal character, beliefs, and behavior. We say that someone is moral when they do the right thing. We say that someone is immoral when they do not do the right thing. There are some doctors that may have a lot of knowledge about any given physiological process, or they may have the knowledge about how to cure some people, but they may not necessarily have good morality in the sense that they do not always do the right thing. And, uh, knowledge is basically neutral. You can use it for good things or you can use it for bad things. Now, morality is how each one of us uses our own personal character and how our beliefs and behavior are shaped according to that. So that's morality. Ethics comes from the weird Greek word ethos, which also means character or practice. Uh, there are some people who think that morality and ethics are basically the same, and I tend to agree with those people, but for some technical reasons, <clears throat> there are some people who prefer to make a division between morality and ethics. So according to these people, ethics is a behavior in different situations. It's a more of an abstract or a philosophical reflection on morality and deciding how to act. Not just doctors, but basically every profession, and I would say almost every human being, sooner or later they will have to face some dilemmas, some ethical dilemmas about what's the right thing to do. Well, that abstract thinking, that philosophical discussion about what's the right thing to do, that's what uh, here in medical ethics we will understand as ethics. That is to say, they behavior in different situations and their reflection on morality and deciding how to act. So that's morality and that's ethics. Now, legality, it's a little different. Legality is what's actually in the law. Now, in an ideal world, the ethical and the legal should always go together. But this is not necessarily always the case, unfortunately, because there can be some 
unjust laws. So sometimes, mm, not just doctors, but a, a lot of people may be in a situation where the legal thing to do is one thing and the moral or ethical thing to do is quite another. So let's say that, uh, just for the sake of argument, let's say that you think that abortion is wrong, but you live in a state where abortion is legal. Well, according to your conscience, you may say, well, in this state, abortion is legal, but within my moral values, abortion is wrong. So what should you do? Well, that's a deep philosophical discussion that a lot of philosophers have paid attention to. Most philosophers believe that you should privilege morality over legality. Morality is more important. I mean, legality is just a bunch of people getting together to write some laws. But those laws may be unjust. And there have been many unjust laws throughout history. Think, for instance, about uh, the Nuremberg laws in Germany. I mean, uh, the Congress of Germany passed those laws. They were democratically written. But that doesn't mean that those laws were moral. Or the same with uh, segregation in the United States or even slavery. I mean, for some time, segregation and slavery, they were legal. It's what the law said. It was not allowed for a black person to marry a white person or vice versa or to go to the same movie theater. No, was it ethical? Was it moral? No, it was not. So not necessarily what is ethical is legal and vice versa. And this is something that we should always keep in mind when it comes to medical ethics. There were a lot of philosophers who've been talking about uh, ethics and um, you know this is really not the subject here but I'm just to, going to mention in passing some of the great ethical points of view because you as future doctors when you have to face some ethical dilemmas well maybe some of the philosophical thinking from some of the greatest philosophers in history might be your guy. So usually most ethical discussions are centered on two great philosophers, which are those two that are here in this slide, Plato and Aristotle. Now, this, uh, this, these two figures here are taken from a very famous painting that's in the Vatican. Uh, it's called the Academy of Athens, because as you know, uh, uh, most philosophers, at least during ancient times, came from Greece. And the older philosopher who has the finger pointing up to the sky, that's Plato. He's probably the first greatest, uh, the first of the greatest philosophers. And the one right next to him holding a book in his hand and with his other hand pointing mm, towards the ground, that's Aristotle. Maybe you've seen Aristotle in the movie on Alexander the Great because he was uh, Alexander the Great's uh, teacher. Now, Plato, he's pointing up towards the sky because he was of the idea that not only in ethics but in all areas of life we have to be in contact with ideas that are in the realm of intellectual thinking. So that's why he's pointing towards up there, towards the sky, but not in, in the religious sense of heaven, but rather in the sense that you elevate yourself towards an intellectual query. Whereas Aristotle was more practical and he was saying, well, yeah, we may engage in thinking, but we also have to think about common problems and not so much about deep ideas. That's basically the difference between these two philosophers. Now, when it came to ethics, Plato believed that whoever does not act ethically, whoever is immoral, it's because that person is uninformed. So let's say that uh, a burglar goes into a house. Well, according to Plato, that person is robbing because he doesn't know that robbery is wrong. If he knew that robbing another house is a bad thing, he wouldn't do it. Now, a lot of people have claimed that this is very naive. I, mean, I tend to agree with them. And Aristotle was one of these people that claimed that uh, Plato's view regarding uh, why people behave immorally is very, very naive because, come on, let's face it. I mean, there are a lot of people who know the difference between good and evil and nevertheless choose to do evil. They choose to do bad. So Aristotle believed that knowledge is not enough and you have to be more practical. Some bad people know they're acting unethically. So education is important 
but it's not the only part when it comes to ethics. Or, or at least you require some other type of education, not just intellectual education. In order to develop uh, ethical people, you have to teach them moral habits, not just intellectual habits. So this is the, this is the importance of, me, of uh, ethical training from infancy. Not so much thinking about deep philosophical ideas, but rather about practical stuff. So that's, this is why it's so important in, in early education to have a uh, role playing and, you know, uh, to um, do group projects and all of that. Because in all those activities, you learn how to get along with each other and you get a natural sense of what's right and wrong without necessarily studying too much. So according to Aristotle, habits were much more important than intellectual thinking when it came to ethics. That's an important difference that we should uh, take into consideration uh, when thinking about the principles of ethics, the difference between Aristotle and Plato's philosophy. Another important difference when it comes to ethics, it's two school of thoughts that are usually called deontology and consequentialism. Now, deontology, comes from the Greek word dientos, which means duty. And according to this point of view, there are things that are intrinsically good or bad, regardless of the consequences. So, for instance, if you're a medical doctor and you think that uh, the fetus is actually a person and that it's always wrong to kill the fetus, well, in that case, if you follow a deontological approach, you would say that abortion is bad even if it leads to good consequences. And let's face it, abortion may have good consequences in terms of uh, the collectivity. I mean, if we have a country where there is overpopulation, well, maybe having abortions would be a good thing because you would reduce uh, the volume of the population and in that sense, you would be able to manage resources in a much more efficient manner. However, if you believe that abortion is intrinsically wrong, then no matter what the consequences are, no matter if there are good consequences derived from this, abortion will still be wrong. Now, that way of thinking about what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's evil, it's called deontological thinking. Because the goodness or badness of actions are judged according to their intrinsic value, regardless of their consequences. This is called the ontology. Probably in the history of philosophy, if you're interested in this stuff, uh, probably the most famous deontological thinker was Immanuel Kant. He was a famous philosopher from the 18th century. Now, Kant said that you must never tell a lie, no matter the consequences. Even if it comes down, according to Kant, that if you're in your house and a serial killer comes to your house asking where your neighbor is, and you know the answer to that, Kant said, in that situation, you cannot lie. Now, if you tell a lie, you will save your neighbor's life. If you tell the truth, probably the serial killer will go and look for your neighbor. What should you do in that situation? Well, according to Kant and deontological thinkers, you have to tell the truth because there is an in intrinsic duty to always tell the truth. And the same goes for every other good action. You cannot judge the goodness or badness of an action according to its consequences. No, you have to judge it according to its intrinsic value. Now, as opposed to deontology, the other philosophical school that you can think of is called consequentialism. Now, under this perspective, uh, you can value whether things are good or bad depending on their consequences. So let's go back to this example of Kant. Well, I mean, it's true that you should always tell the truth, but you should think about the consequences of a specific case. So if in that case you tell the truth, the killer will look for your neighbor and will kill him. So it's better not to tell the truth. So there are cases where consequences may be different and the goodness or badness of any given action should be measured by the consequences. 
Now, in a medical context, we have many examples of this. For instance, let's, let's take vaccines as an example. Well, we all know that when you apply vaccines in a population, a few people may die. Now, is that, is that good or bad? Well, it depends. I mean, it's never good to kill people, of course. But if you're going to save a greater number of people, if that's going to serve a greater purpose, then we may say that that act was good because the consequences, even if there were some side effects that were harmful, overall the consequences were for the greater good. So if we're going to judge that even if when we apply vaccine, vaccines, some people are going to die, from a consequentialist point of view, that's still a good thing. So the goodness or badness of actions, according to consequentialism, is not really intrinsic. It will depend on the consequences that are derived from those, uh, from those uh, procedures. So why is it important for physicians to know about ethics? I mean, what's the deal with this? Why would the USMLE include a section on ethics? Well, I think this is a very tricky question because uh, all professions have a code of ethics. But I think we could answer this by imagining what the world would look like if medical doctors had no ethics. Let's say that we live in a country where there are great doctors, where doctors really know their stuff, they really know how to cure diseases, but let's say that they're not really ethical. That they, mm, for instance, if they don't like a patient because of his skin color or whatever other reason, they don't apply the same treatment because they just don't like them. What would the world be like if we had doctors like that? What would the world be like if we had doctors that were very knowledgeable in technical stuff but had no ethics? I think it would defeat the whole purpose of the medical profession. I mean, why are some of you choosing to be doctors? What's your motivation? Well, I mean, some people may say, well, because I want to earn a lot of money. And, you know, that may be legitimate. I mean, earning money is not bad. And that, that's good. I mean, there's, there's no problem with that. But there is a greater purpose to serve here, and that is helping other people. So it's really useless to know a lot about the human body if you're not using that knowledge for a good purpose. So th that's why it's very, very important for physicians to know about ethics because uh, knowledge is power and depending on how you will use that power that will decide whether or not you really are a good doctor it's much better to have a doctor who doesn't have such great knowledge but is ethical than to have a doctor who has a lot of knowledge but is very unethical because he can do far more harm so what would the world look like if medical doctors had no ethics well I think it would be a very sad world. I think it would be like the world of the Nazis. Take, for instance, Joseph Mengele, who is this gentleman that we have in this slide over here. Now, Joseph Mengele, you probably, some of you may have heard of him. He was a Nazi doctor. Uh, he was well educated. He has some technical knowledge, good technical knowledge about what uh, medicine was, was like, and about uh, you know how diseases work and how treatment works and all of that but by the 1930s he began a human experimentation program with twins and actually he was called Dr. Death and he was one of the ones that was in Auschwitz he was in various death camps as you know people who were taken to Auschwitz uh, they were forced to work but some of them were also subjects of human experimentation. Now, human experimentation was going on before this, but Joseph Mengele was one of the ones who took it to a new lab. Now, from these experiments that he did with twins, and they were various, uh, there were many different types of, of experiments. One of the most famous ones was uh, injecting dye colors in the eyes of twins to see what the results would be. 
which is really an atrocious thing. Now, from these human experiments, I mean, they were really barbarous because nothing significant was gathered from these experiments. No significant medical knowledge was taken from this. But here is an important ethical question. Even if there were some significant results from these experiments, would it be okay for some doctor to experiment with a patient without their consent? And that's a great ethical question. I mean, are we allowed to play with other people's lives? Even if it's for the good of the knowledge, even if it's for the good of the medical profession. Well, that's what medical ethics is about. I mean, it's about finding out what the principles should be that guide medical ethics. Now, there is a consensus that Joseph Mengele was a profoundly bad person, a profoundly immoral man. And he was immoral because he did not follow the basic principles of medical ethics. So when we talk about medical ethics, we talk about four basic principles in medical ethics. Autonomy, beneficence, non-malfeasance, and justice. Pretty much all the authors that talk about medical ethics come to agree that those are the four basic principles that guide uh, uh, the discussion on, on medical ethics and, and how doctors should behave. So let's begin with the first one, which is autonomy. Now, autonomy comes from the word auto, which means self, and nomi mean, comes from the Greek word nomos, which means uh, rule or government. So autonomy is basically self-government, and it's basically the idea that you are the owner of your own body and no one has the right to take it away from you. No one has the right to intervene in your body without your permission. So autonomy can be defined as the ability of the person to make his or her own decisions. Now, we're all adults, and we highly value this. If we were children, it would be different. But, you know, for convention, it has been established that once you turn 18, you have the power to decide on your own what to do with your own body. And this applies not only to the medical profession. This applies all across the board. For instance, getting a tattoo. Do you have to ask permission uh, from your parents if you are, let's say, 24 years old to get a tattoo? On your arm, do you have to ask permission? No, of course not, because you are the one who decides on your own what goes in your body. But what if you are 14? Are you allowed to go to a tattoo store and get a tattoo? Well, I don't know exactly what the law say, but my guess is that no, you cannot. You cannot get a tattoo on your own if you're 14 because you are not fully autonomous. Now, there is a consensus that autonomy is achieved when you turn into an adult, when you become 18 years old. Now, why is autonomy so important? Well, in the medical profession, it's very important because doctors already have power over patients. So they must not overstep boundaries. I mean, doctors have the power of life and death over you. They can give you some medicine that may have some side effects that it's, might be dangerous. But they also have the power to save your life. So they're very powerful when it comes, I mean, in the doctor-patient relationship, obviously the differential of power is in favor of the doctor. The doctor has far greater power than the patient. But in order to balance this, it's very important to keep autonomy. And never should a doctor proceed without the permission of a patient. This is to avoid when, what in philosophy is called paternalism. There was a very famous philosopher in the 19th century, John Stuart Mill, who said that pater, paternalism was one of the worst things in the world. I mean, when we believe we have the right to decide over other people, that's very dangerous. I mean, the best way to live, according to John Stuart Mill, is letting each person decide what's best for them. And just tour me was a little bit controversial because he said that this applied to prostitution, to drugs, uh, to pornography, etc. But followers of uh, John Stuart Mill, who are basically the libertarians of today, 
they think that, well, look, if someone decides to take drugs, let them. If someone decides to become a prostitute, that's her or his problem. If we believe, think that we know better than, they, than them what's best for them, that's paternalism. That's behaving like a parent towards other adults. Now, it's okay to behave like a parent towards children, but not towards other adults. And I think all of you are probably, uh, will probably be very upset if other people come and treat you as parents without you wanting them to be so. So paternalism is not a good thing. And in order to avoid paternalism, the principle of autonomy is very important. So in order to make sure that the patient complies either with the research or with the treatment, the patient must manifest informed consent. You cannot apply any treatment or any research or any diagnosis on a patient without their consent. This is very, very important. And what's informed consent? Well, it's a clear appreciation and understanding of the facts, implications, and consequences of an action. I mean, for someone to understand what's going to be done on their body, they have to understand what's going on and they have to say, yes, it's okay. But in order for them to say that it's okay, they have to have a clear appreciation and understanding of the facts. The individual must have adequate reasoning faculties and be in possession of all relevant facts. If you are a doctor and you are going to apply a treatment to a patient, that patient has to have the mental capacity to understand what you are telling him. And that's why you have to speak in very clear terms. I mean, the patient has to give consent, but that consent has to be informed. If you are hiding some information from the patient about any potential risk or something like that, then you're not being ethical. For you, in order to be ethical, you have to make a full disclosure of what the benefits and the risks are of a given procedure. And of course, for the patient to give consent, he has to be capacitated. Now, there are some people who are not capacitated to give consent. Who are those people? First of all, children, because we assume that children are not uh, fully capacitated, either intellectually or emotionally, to make the best decision for themselves. So in that case, that's why parents have to decide over them what's the best option. But that's not the only people who, are, who may not be capacitated for informed consent. There may be other people who, for instance, those who suffer from post-stress syndrome, maybe they're too stressed in order to understand uh, the full implications of any medical decision, they may not be able to decide on their own. People with uh, intellectual disability, or as it used to be called, the mentally retarded, they also do not have the mental capacity to understand what's best for them. Or people with a severe mental disorder, for instance, the psychotics. Uh, psychotics uh, may not be in touch with reality to understand what's the best treatment is for them. So in those cases, uh, well, uh, they do not have the capacity to give informed consent. Someone else will do it for them. People who have had uh, severe sleep deprivation, yeah, uh, they also don't have a good judgment of what reality is because their cognitive abilities are influenced by sleep deprivation. Uh, people with Alzheimer's disease, I mean, they're not really able to reason accordingly. Or people in coma. Obviously, if you're in a coma, we cannot ask you what the medical procedure you would like to, to be because you do not have the capacity to respond. In those cases, you don't have the capacity to give informed consent. Ethics tells us that something else should be sought. Now, even if you are mentally fit to give your informed consent, it's nevertheless true that unfortunately, mm, we all sign papers without understanding what the papers say. So let's say that uh, the doctor tells us about a treatment that he's going to try on us and he asks us to sign the papers and yeah I mean most people will just sign without reading 
So unfortunately, we sometimes uh, give in to social pressure and we apparently give consent when it's actually not all that free. Sometimes it could be forced. So physicians should really try to make patients understand what's going on, what the risks are. And these decisions should not be rushed. I mean, if the patient asks for time to think about it, then the doctor should allow the patient to take that time. If uh, a patient is undecisive, undecisive about any particular treatment, well, the doctor might be in the obligation to inform the patient what are the risks and what are the benefits, but he should not really push it because in the end, it should be the patient who has the last word. So there are many examples of uh, signed papers that uh, patients may sign that may not be really understood. For instance, DNRs or do not resuscitate. Now, people may not be all that clear about what do not resuscitate really means, but they just may go ahead and sign it. Now, in order for there to be full informed consent, the doctor has to make sure that the patient fully understands what, for instance, do not resuscitate means. So how do we know when uh, a consent is really informed? Well, there are really three basic uh, requirements. First of all, there is disclosure. That is that the information must be presented in clear and understandable language. This is something extremely important in the medical profession. I mean, lay people, and that includes me because I'm not a medical doctor, lay people or non-physicians, sometimes we don't fully understand what the medical terms are. Now, you as doctors have to make it extremely clear to the patient so that the patient makes the best decision. That's the first element of informed consent. The second element is capacity, and that is the ability of the patient to understand the information that is being provided. If you suspect that this patient or any given patient does not have the mental capacity to understand what he or she is being told, then you should take some other measures. You have to take into account that informed consent is only really informed consent when the patient has the capacity to make a decision. If the patient is suffering from the previous conditions that we talked about, PTSD, Alzheimer's, uh, sleep deprivation, and so on, then in that case, there really is no informed consent. And the third requirement is voluntariness or absence of coercion. Now, there are many ways to coerce. I mean, I'm not talking about taking out a gun and putting a gun on a patient's head. No, that, that, it doesn't necessarily have to be like that. But if you're really pushing it, going far beyond just informing the patient, but you're really pushing him and saying, you have to do this because if you don't do it, you're going uh, to have very bad consequences and so, and so on. Well, in that case, the patients may feel coerced. Now, it is your duty to inform correctly about the benefits and the risks of any given treatment or any given medical procedure. But it cannot be coerced on the patient. The patient has to give permission voluntarily. Now, another aspect, uh, another important aspect in autonomy is uh, confidentiality. Confidentiality is basically mm, the secret that, that goes on between a doctor and a patient. The details of a case cannot be discussed with other people. And that's very important in the doctor and patient relationship. And we'll talk about this in another lecture when we go into a little bit of more detail about the uh, uh, doctor-patient relationship. But confidentiality is very important in autonomy. I mean, uh, a, a patient will not be fully autonomous if the details of any given case are discussed with other people. So, in the same manner that a patient has the right to accept or refuse treatment, that same patient has the right to be protected with confidentiality. Physicians may not discuss a patient's medical records with other people unless they are unauthorized. Now, sometimes you may be in, 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 in your office or, you know, for a doctor's appointment and a patient comes in with his wife 
and they both sit in front of you. Well, in that case, there is a tacit understanding that the patient is giving you permission to talk about the case in front of his wife. I mean, uh, giving consent uh, for, uh, to discuss the details of, uh, of a case with other people it doesn't necessarily require signing a paper or anything like that. But, you know, you can use your common sense to understand when a patient wants the details of his case to be discussed with other people and when not. And if you are in doubt, then you should always be on the cautious side of confidentiality. In any case, you can ask the patient, is it okay to discuss these details with any of your family members? And depending on the answer from the patient, then you may proceed. Now, there are some cases where confidentiality may be relaxed. There are some exceptions to, to confidentiality. Sometimes cases must be reported to the government. So even if a patient comes in talking about his, ca his, you know, his case and he asks you not to divulge the details of his case, there are some special circumstances that allow for a doctor to discuss the details of the case with other people. First, infectious diseases, such as uh, sexually transmitted diseases, uh, tuberculosis, and some types of cancer. Now, this is done mostly for statistical purposes. I mean, governments have to know how many people in a given population have, let's say, AIDS or tuberculosis or, you know, any other uh, epi epidemics. It's important because that's for epimediological control. So in those cases, you may be able to share the details of any given case with the government, but it's mostly for statistical purposes. Another uh, circumstance that allows uh, a doctor to break uh, confidentiality is in severe cases of violence and all gunshot wounds. If you're in a hospital and a patient comes in with a gunshot wound, you have the duty to report that, even if the patient asks you not to. And why is that? Well, because there is a suspicion that there might have been some criminal activity involved. So you have the duty to report this. And also severe cases of violence. I mean, if uh, a woman comes in, you know, with a severe signs of battery, of having been uh, beaten, uh, if it's severe enough, you have to report this because uh, there's the suspicion that criminality is involved. It's the same for child abuse or neglect. Even if it's only a suspicion, it must be reported. This is a little bit different from cases of uh, domestic violence in women. I mean, if it's very severe, you have to report it. If it's not so severe and the woman asks you not to report it, then you should not report it. But in the case of children, it's different. Even if it's only a suspicion, it must be reported. Because again, uh, this is in order, uh, th this is because uh, the, there, if, a, if a child comes in abuse, there is a suspicion of criminality, and this has to be reported. You have the ethical obligation to break confidentiality. Now, how do we know uh, when, a, when a child is abused? Uh, what are some of the signs of child abuse? Well, uh, there, is our, there could be multiple unexplained injuries. Uh, if there is genital trauma, or if there are sexually transmitted diseases, you have the duty to report this, even if it's only a suspicion. And as for child neglect, uh, well, poor hygiene. I mean, if the kid comes in all dirty or malnutrition, if you realize that the kid is not being well fed, you also have the obligation to report that. Now, most likely, or not necessarily most likely, but there could be uh, a case when a parent asks you not to report it, or when the parent gives you some explanation. You say, oh, well, he looks skinny, but it's because uh, all every uh, relative uh, is also skinny, so it runs in the family. Well, that's, that's not enough for you. I mean, if you have the suspicion that this kid is not being well-fed and that he has malnutrition going on, no matter what the excuses that the parent gives you are, 
you still have to report it. Now, as I said, in the cases of adults, this is different. If an adult is abused, not to the point of criminality, of severe cases of violence, then in that case, they are protected by confidentiality. So if a beaten woman comes in, let's say with a black eye, and she specifically asks you not to report it, you have to respect that confidentiality. Unless it's a severe form of violence, such as uh, you know, gunshot wound or something else, in those cases, you do have to report it. Now, remember that there are some people who do not have the capacity for informed consent. So one of those people is our children. And if children are not able to make decisions on their own, who represents them? Well, children are represented by parents or legal guardians. Uh, they are entitled to decide for the children. And physicians are not above guardians. So if you think that any given treatment is the best option for a child, but the parent of that child does not want that treatment on their child, you have to respect that decision because your uh, right is not above the right of the parent. However, there are some complex cases. If guardians refuse a treatment that is undeniably good for the child, especially if it's an emergency or a life or death situa situation, then you may appeal to a court. And uh, in hospitals, there are many emergency appeals where let's say a kid is coming in and he needs immediately a blood transfusion in order to save his life. And let's say that the kid's parents are Jehovah's Witnesses who do not want their kids to receive a transfusion due to religious reasons. Well, in that case, you can appeal to a court and at least in the United States, there are emergency courts where a judge can almost immediately issue a warrant where the physician is allowed to make the blood transfusion over the desire of the parents. But remember, these are in extreme cases, in life or death situations, and usually in emergency cases. For other purposes, the parents have a stronger right than the physicians when it comes to deciding what the best options are. So let's consider a case study. For instance, let's say that due to exposure to radiation, a 35-year-old man and his 8-year-old son are diagnosed with a type of cancer. Now, if they're subjected to treatment, there's an 80% chance of survival. The man refuses treatment and he insists that his son, his son should also be left alone so he can die with him. What's to be done? Well, it's not an extreme emergency, but nevertheless, it's a life or death situation. So I think in this case, the doctors may appeal to the courts, and it may take a while because it's not a life or death situation. This may go to a case, to, to a trial, and there may be some litigation. But I think what the doctors should do is not just to give up. They should appeal to the courts and leave to the judges the decision to issue a warrant allowing the doctors to apply the treatment even against the wishes of the parents. Now, not all minors have to be represented by guardians. There are some people younger than 18 who may have autonomy if they are emancipated. And there are various ways to be emancipated. It could be that a minor, and when I say minor, I mean someone younger than 18. It could be that a minor has formally filed for it. This is a, usually called like a parent-child divorce. When a child asks uh, to be released from the guardianship of their parents. Or it could also be when a minor lives on his or her own. Because of course, here the presumption is that if a minor lives on his own, then he has the sufficient capacity to decide on his own. I mean, if nobody's taking care of him, then no one has the right really to decide over the minor what's the best treatment option for him or the best medical decision for him. 
if a minor is married, he also is emancipated, so he has the autonomy, he has the, the the privilege of autonomy when it comes to medical decisions. Again, the presumption is that if you're married, you're mature enough to understand what the risks are or, or what the best options are when it comes to a medical treatment. If a minor is pregnant, then that minor is also autonomous. This is very important when it comes to cases of abortion. A, a father of a pregnant girl cannot decide over the pregnant girl whether or not she should have an abortion. It's for the own girl to decide. And of course, if the minor has children, well, again, there's the assumption that that minor already has enough maturity and capacity to understand what's best for her because she has already gone through the process of motherhood and that's enough for maturation. Now, there are also cases of children that have not been emancipated but they may still be considered autonomous. That is to say that they don't require parental permission for specific medical decisions. Now, these non-emancipated children may still be considered autonomous, but only for a few special circumstances. For the purposes of contraception, if a, uh, let's say, a, a minor goes to a doctor asking for some uh, contraceptive uh, methods, either condoms or uh, contraceptive pills and so on, they do not have to ask permission from their parents to do this. The doctor may proceed with a contraception measure on the minor without the parents approval. Also for the treatment of sexually transmitted diseases, the parents do not have to be notified about it and they do not have to give permission. For pregnancy, if a girl is pregnant, she does not have to ask her parents permission about what the best treatment should be. She is autonomous enough to decide on her own, even if she's not emancipated. For alcohol and substance abuse, if a minor comes in with an addiction problem, uh, they do not have to ask permission from their parents in order to proceed with the best line of treatment for a substance abuse uh, disorder. And also in the cases of emergencies. In emergencies, there is no time to ask the parents uh, what the best option should be. So really the doctor should proceed according to what the doctor thinks is the best criterion, regardless of the parent's decision, but only in emergency cases. Now there are also cases of supported autonomy. That is that uh, physicians may intervene to take care of mentally ill patients if they represent a danger to others or to themselves. This has been very controversial because usually in the field of psychiatry, um, doctors agree that only those psychiatric patients that want to be treated either with uh, pharmacological treatments or psychotherapeutic treatments or internalization or you know other approaches, they should always give consent. However, if the mentally ill patient represents a danger to himself or to other people, then there is the door open for the physicians to intervene to take care of the patients without the patient's approval. So when it comes to psychiatry, consent is a golden rule. But if the patient is a danger to others or to himself, then consent is relaxed. Now this is this this usually happens with uh, psychotic patients, with patients who have a psychotic disorder, because they are not uh, in the full capacity to, to understand what's best for them, and they may become dangerous. They may pose a danger to themselves or to others. In those cases, then medical staff are allowed to intervene in what's called supported autonomy. I mean, these people require the guardianship of other people, of, of doctors and, and, and relatives, because they may pose a danger to themselves and to others. Okay, let's talk about the other uh, principles of medical ethics, which is beneficence. Now, beneficence is mm, an action that is done for the benefit of others. Beneficent actions can be taken to help prevent or remove harms 
or to simply improve the situation of others. So beneficence is basically doing good. And this is very important for doctors. I mean, it's, it's what you're here for, right? You want to help other people. So your, uh, your ethical guidelines should be guided by the principle of beneficence in the sense that you are here to help patients. You are here to do good to other people. Now, due to the nature of relationship between physicians and patients, doctors have an obligation to prevent and remove harms and weigh and balance possible benefits against possible risks of an action. So when you're doing good, when, or when you're hoping to do good by providing a treatment to a patient, you have to consider what the side effects are. You have to consider what are the potential risks of what you're doing. Now, this is all within the principle of beneficence. Now, if there are risks to an action, if there are side effects, how do you judge when an action is good or not? Well, usually medical ethics uh, brings in the principle of, uh, or the doctrine of double effect in order to consider whether or not an action is beneficent, whether or not an action is good. Now, what this doctrine says is that some actions may be authorized under beneficence, yet cause harm. So, for instance, uh, um, let's say uh, you have a patient with high blood pressure and you assign a medication in order to lower the blood pressure. That may have side effects and, you know, that may do some harm to the patient. However, that's not necessarily bad if there are other conditions that in the end make this a greater good. So a doctor is morally authorized to cause harm if first the action is not in itself immoral. So prescribing a medication for high blood pressure that's not in itself immoral even if it has some side effects. Number two, if the action is undertaken only with the intention of achieving the possible good effect without intending the possible bad effect. I mean, if he was up for the doctor, he would definitely lower the blood pressure without causing side effects. So his intention here is very important in considering whether or not it's a good action. He intends to lower the blood pressure without having side effects. That intention is another requirement for the doctrine of double effect to be in. Number three, although it may be foreseen, the action does not bring about the possible good effect by means of the possible bad effect. I mean, you're not actively looking for the side effects. The side effects may be there, but what you're really looking for is lowering the blood pressure. If you do that, then you're meeting the requirement for the, the double effect. And fourth, the action should be undertaken for a proportionally grave reason. I mean, this is the sense of proportion. It's really no good lowering the blood pressure if the side effects eventually lead to death, for instance. In that case, that would not be a moral action to follow. But it would be moral if you apply a medication to lower the blood pressure and you have some minor side effects. I mean, the proportion is kept. You did greater good than harm. In that case, you are authorized to do so under the doctrine of double effect. So for instance, let's consider a case study. A physician is concerned about a hepatitis I epidemic in his county. He promotes an information campaign and exhorts community members to get a vaccine. He knows that there is an extremely low risk of side effects, perhaps even death. Now, 2,500 persons are vaccinated. One of the patients, however, dies as a result of the vaccine. Is the physician ethically accountable? Well, under the principle of double effect, no, he's not. Because, uh, first of all, the action itself, given the vaccine, is not immoral. Second of all, he did not intend to kill that single person. I mean, it may have been a side effect, but that was not his intention. Third, although he may have foreseen that maybe some people would die as a result of the vaccine, he did not do so by means of the possible bad effect. I mean, he did not cure the people by spe specifically targeting, uh, killing that person in particular. And fourth, well, 
there was a sense of proportion. I mean, he vaccinated, and you know the vaccines save a lot of lives. He vaccinated 2,500 people, and one person died. The proportion is kept. So, no, the doctor is not ethically accountable. Okay, let's consider a third uh, principle of uh, medical ethics, which is non-maleficence. And this is encapsulated in the famous phrase, primum non nocere, in Latin, which means first do no harm. Well, a physician must not harm. The only way he can harm a patient is as a side effect of a good action, following the principle of a double effect, as we discussed previously. And the benefits must significantly outweigh the harm. So, I mean, this is a very important principle in medical ethics because we all may have great ideas about how to save patients, but we have to think about the side effects. So first, it's doing no harm. If a treatment is going to cause an even greater harm, then that treatment should not be pursued. We should avoid at all costs uh, thinking such as, well, the treatment was a success, but the patient died. Oh, that's ridiculous. I mean, if the patient died, you did a lot of harm. And the greatest obligation is first doing no harm. That's the principle of non-maleficence. One of the first uh, physicians to understand this was Hippocrates. Uh, Hippocrates, he was the first physician to insist on non-maleficence. He was a physician from the fourth century before the Common Era. He was famous for the idea that uh, diseases are not God's punishments, uh, especially epilepsy. People would think that, you know, when people had epilepsy, it was because some demon uh, possessed that person. Uh, Hippocrates one of the, was one of the first to understand that, no, you know, diseases are natural phenomena. It's not a punishment from the gods. And he was one of the first to apply the principle of first doing no harm the principle of non-maleficence. And, you know, when you uh, recite your contemporary Hippocratic Oath, once you become doctors, uh, part of the Hippocratic Oath is precisely doing no harm, the principle of non-maleficence. Now, there are some tricky questions because uh, with non-maleficence, because, I mean, how do you balance non-maleficence and autonomy? What if a patient asks you to perform a procedure on that patient that may be harmful, but nevertheless, the patient wants him or wants you to do it. So for instance, plastic surgery. Let's say a patient asks you to perform a surgery on her or him. Uh, and you know that you know, there are some risks in that uh, surgery and that that surgery is not really needed. What do you do? Well, it, it's kind of hard to balance non-maleficence with autonomy. Most medical ethicists will agree that non-maleficence is more important than autonomy. So if a patient asks you to do a surgery that's not needed, no matter how much he or she asks you for it, you're not allowed to do it under non-maleficence because your first duty is to do no harm. In the case of aesthetic surgery, that's a little bit more tricky because uh, aesthetic surgeons may decline to operate on patients if they do not believe that the surgery is in the patient's best interest. Uh, aesthetic surgeons should be reluctant to operate on those with unrealistic expectation because the risks of surgery may outweigh the benefits. And remember, it's always first, the, 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 the first principle is always first do no harm, non-maleficence. But there are some tricky situations. For instance, what if a patient is diagnosed with a body I integrity identity disorder. This is a very strange uh, psychiatric condition where a patient feels that a part of his body does not belong to his own body. So there are some patients with this disorder, for instance, that feel that any particular limb, a leg or a hand, is alien to them. And they are, they, they feel uneasy, uh, uneasy with these uh, body parts. So in order to relieve the stress, they want one of those limbs to be cut away from their body. And there are some patients who have had surgery and they feel very relieved after uh, the, the amputation. So if a patient approaches a surgeon asking the surgeon to remove the limb, what should the doctor do? Well, most, I, I, I've asked around, I've asked uh, 
uh, doctors and ethicists, what would they do in this situation? And almost unanimously, they have told me they would refuse amputation, even if the patient asks for it, because non-maleficence is more important than autonomy. And that may be true, but the thing is, the, the important ethical question is, how is this different from cosmetic surgery? I mean, there are many people who go to the cosmetic doctor to ask for breast implants, and the doctor proceeds. Now, a very, a, a really ethical doctor should consider whether or not that patient needs breast implants. Maybe that patient just needs psychotherapy, and maybe a non-surgical option should be the best course. But as we all know, there is an industry of breast implants, and we should put into, the, into question the ethics of that industry following the principle of non-maleficence. So as I was saying, autonomy is usually more important than non-maleficence. However, even if the principle of autonomy should allow for such grave injuries as amputations, in individual cases, it has to be investigated whether the patient decides autonomously or whether this decision is de determined by a neuropsychological disease. And that's why some of these patients, the first line of treatment should probably first be psychotherapy or even some pharmacological therapy before proceeding to amputation or plastic surgery. Okay. And the last principle of medical ethics that we should study here is justice. Well, we could define justice as the burdens and benefits of new or experimental treatments and how they must be distributed equally among all groups in society. So this is basically about the fair distribution of scarce resources, competing needs, rights, and obligations. So a key question here is, who should receive scarce medical resources and how should we distribute them in order to realize the best outcomes? So making the system as a whole more fair is one of the goals of justice. Providing the basic minimum of care to the most people possible while not reducing the standard of care enjoyed by others, that's where you find balance. So taking cue from the principle of uh, justice, we can ask some important ethical questions when it comes to medical practice. For instance, should healthcare be universal? Should taxpayers found healthcare for the needy? How do we avoid free riding? And this is, you know, one of the big deals with Obamacare and <laughs> all the political implications that uh, that controversy has had. So strictly speaking, these are questions for politicians. But physicians should give them some thought, because how can one best comply with the Hippocratic Oath if not asking this question? I mean, is universal healthcare the best way to follow the Hippocratic Oath? Can you uh, commit to the Hippocratic Oath while uh, proposing alternative systems of healthcare or privatization of healthcare and so on? So a key question is, how can we ration healthcare? And there are basically four ways of doing it. First, by cost. And this is how it's mostly those, how, this is how it's mostly done in the United States. Whoever has the money to pay for healthcare should receive it. If you don't have the money, then you should not receive healthcare. Now, from an ethical point of view, this is very questionable. And I don't think the Hippocratic Oath uh, is very consistent with the cost criterion. Another criterion could be by citizenship. If you live in the United States, you should be welcome in American hospitals. But if, an, a, Mex if a Mexican or a Canadian comes to the United States, then that person should not be welcome in our hospitals. Again, this is also questionable um, from an ethical point of view. But on the other hand, it also causes the problem of free riding. I mean, if you're a taxpayer and you're paying good taxes in order to have a good uh, hospital system, in the United States, why should a citizen from another country that has not paid taxes come to this country to get privileges if he has not paid uh, taxes? So, you know, it's a very tricky situation. Another criterion could be by time. And this is, 
more ethical than the previous two criteria. And according to this criterion, emergencies have priority over non-emergencies. So if you show up in a hospital with a gunshot wound, well, then you should be immediately treated and you should have preference over someone that has a condition that's not as urgent. And also by likelihood of recovery. Let's face it, we have scarce resources. So you have to discriminate. You have to find out who are the best subjects or the best candidates to receive treatment. The most rational way to do it, apparently, or it would seem, is by uh, as assigning resources to those who are most likely to recover. So that's another criterion that should be taken into account. Okay, so that wraps up our lecture today. Let's consider two um, questions that are written in the style that you will find in US Emily and consider what the best options are. So, a seven-year-old girl is brought to the hospital by a woman who has been entrusted with her care while the parents are away on vacation. While playing, the girl severe one of her fingers. Doctors agree that prompt action can restore the finger. However, if action is delayed, the girl can lose her finger. So, what should the physicians do? Should they try to contact the parents for permission? Should they seek legal injunction allowing the operation? Should they operate at once? Should they seek consent from the woman in care of the girl? Or should they seek further information from additional specialists in this type of surgery? Well, obviously here it's that given that it's an emergency, it's not really a life or death situation, but it's an extreme emergency, there really is no time to ask permission from anyone else. So the doctor should operate at once. Again, given the emergency. If we were not an emergency, then you know perhaps they should try to contact the parents for permission. Okay, let's take a look at another US MLE type of question. A 50-year-old man is seen by his physician for his monthly appointment to monitor his diabetes. The physician provides encouragement with his diet. Days later, the patient's wife calls the physician to ask details about her husband's diet so she may cook appropriately. The doctor should A. Have the nurse call her and explain the diet. B. Give her an internet link explaining the diets. C. Obtaining permission from her husband in order to discuss the case with her. D. Schedule an appointment with her to discuss face-to-face. -face. E. Ask her if her husband requested that she call. Or F. Offer her a referral to another physician so she can be checked for diabetes. I think here the most likely option should be C. Obtaining permission from her husband in order to discuss the case with her. Remember, this is an adult and there is confidentiality. The details of a case cannot be discussed with anyone else unless they're given permission. So in order to discuss the details of the case with the patient's wife, the doctor should first ask the patient if it's okay. If the patient complies and agrees, then yes, you may share the details. If not, then you should not share the details with them. Okay, so that's the end of our lecture. Thank you very much.